thanks very much. Thank you, um, Brendan, for introducing us. And thank you to Jill and her team for um, hosting us today. It's, it's great to be back here. Um, it's going to be pretty straightforward. I just want to uh, introduce the project because it is to really um, involve as many people as possible in what, what we're doing um, and to, you know, sort of really kind of reach out anyone who wants to be inter interested in, I mean, I think we all are interested in China now. Uh, it would be wonderful if you were involved in what we are trying to do. Uh, I was a, an official um, in Beijing at the British Embassy in 2001, um, and I remember uh, at that time, China was just finalizing its negotiations to join the World Trade Organization after 14, 15 years of long, long debate and uh, kind of very, very complicated negotiations with the US and then uh, with the EU. And um, it's sort of interesting to think that's 10 years, you know, November, I think, was the November, the beginning of December was when it was finalized. Um, what our assessment was at that time and what's actually happened in that 10 years. Um, in fact, I was looking at The Economist and other uh, newspapers uh, in 2001 the other day, and uh, they were surprisingly uh, gloomy, um, sort of saying China's going to open up its domestic industries to a lot of very fierce competition. Its agricultural sector, which was after all nearly a quarter of its GDP then, was going to be very uh, fundamentally challenged by uh, the liberalization of tariffs and the um, opening up of the sort of domestic market. And, you know, the assessments were, in the long term, optimistic, but thinking that uh, in China would be um, really kind of, you know, challenged uh, and in some ways would probably come out of this uh, maybe a little worse off than it expected. The, the political objective to join the WTO <coughs> was clear, that China would be part of the global economic and eventually political community, uh, but certainly the economic kind of gains were uh, more difficult to kind of really foretell. Well, we're 10 years on from there, and I think we can say that what 2001 did do, which we didn't expect um, so profoundly, was to unleash uh, forces of productivity uh, so that we stand now with China, the world's biggest importer and exporter, uh, the world's second biggest economy, uh, the world's biggest holder of foreign reserves, uh, and a whole sort of list of things, you know, if it's not number one, it's number two or number three. So this has been quite an extraordinary <coughs> transformation. China has become more quickly than I think we expected, and as official, I didn't expect this so quickly, uh, more successfully than we probably expected uh, this enormous economy. Since 2001, it's uh, tripled, maybe quadrupled the size of its economy. When you think uh, of the kind of immense sort of factory-like growth of its GDP, this is an extraordinary thing. But it's also for its leadership, the elite leadership who are now going to go through a transition over the next 12 months uh, to a fifth generation leadership. Uh, it has also created some profound socio-economic, uh, socio-political challenges. Uh, from, you could say, from 1949 when the um, Communist Party was victorious in the Civil War until 1978, during the period of Maoism, state-directed economy, kind of borrowed from the Soviet Union, uh, kind of era, I suppose, of, um, you know, really the key thing was to sort of uh, stabilize society, uh, but to do it through these enormous campaigns like the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. And these had huge social costs, huge social costs. Uh, the country was united, that's true, however, the costs were immense. From 1978 to 90 to till today, you could say that the one thing that the elite leadership have said uh, and the ministries under them have said is, you know, you take economic production as the key thing. It's said at all the congresses. It was said by Hu Jintao in 2007. It's said during the National People's Congresses. This is the one thing that everyone kind of agrees with. Economic <coughs> productivity is the key thing. This is where we are performed. I mean, the kind of performative legitimacy of the party. But really, uh, in the last couple of years, more strongly, uh, through particularly people like Wen Jiabao, the current premier, you see this kind of talk of we need to think much more about socio-political outcomes, how to create more justice in society, how to have more balance, how to deal with equality, these kind of things, um, because it is a very unequal society at the moment, although there is huge um, you know, kind of pr uh, productivity and prosperity. So this is the kind of policy advice that we are giving, the context China is undertaking enormously challenging, challenging transitional decisions. Uh, it is taking them with a new leadership. It is taking them at a time when it is globally more prominent than it has ever been before. 
uh, in a way more quickly than it thought it would have to take it. And the whole idea of setting up this academic network is because, of course, we need to be part of that. Uh, China's internal issues are, in fact, global ones. What happens in its 31 provinces and autonomous regions are things that affect us. Uh, if it has problems with its science supply chain, well, it's a big exporter. It absolutely impacts on us. And so, really, we are trying to gather as much expertise on as many areas as possible throughout Europe to make sure that our policymakers in the European um, External Action Service and the member states uh, have policy which is informed by good um, analysis, by good empirical studies, and by knowledge. I mean, policy informed by knowledge is obviously probably more successful than policy um, you know, informed by wishful thinking. Basically, to uh, get involved, um, I mean, just to sort of explain a little bit about the project, uh, it was fa it's, it's funded, obviously, by the European Union. We started work in January this year, so only um, nine months old. Um, and as I just said, you know, the key thing that we want to do is to have um, European policymakers, you know, make available to them the best kind of analysis um, about the political, economic, and social issues in China at the moment. Uh, the consortium that we're involved with, Steinbeis in Germany, the Galway Development Service um, International, who are here today, the University of Nottingham, and Chatham House, the Royal Institute of International Cares, uh, Affairs in London. Uh, we have key, uh, the key areas that we focus on are economics, politics, and society. The three things that we really do, it's actually um, put up there as four, but I mean, really, the, the, the three things that we do um, you know, as part of our fundamental uh, job are to do short briefs on a number of issues. We've done them on um, international affairs for China. We've done them on um, economic issues. We've done them on uh, you know, current internal issues in China, like uh, social protests, these kind of things. Uh, these are delivered you know, to the um, commission every month, really analyzing by a key expert you know, what is happening. And these experts are any of our 250 network at the moment across Europe. The second thing we do, and in fact, um, Jeremy and, and Henrik uh, today are you know, doing this at the moment. We are um, working on long papers. Um, so this year, uh, they'll be published on our um, website, but we're doing papers on Chinese investment into the EU, Chinese investment into the greater European area, which is largely Russia and uh, Turkey, um, Chinese um, EU relations, where they'll be by 2020, China and the US and the EU. These papers we um, publicly publish. Uh, we publish commissioning bids so people can bid for them. So this is a, a very good way for people to become involved. Uh, and then, uh, basically, uh, the final thing we do is events, events like um, the event that you are at today. Um, the easiest way to get involved is through our website. Um, there's a, a kind of a form there that people fill in, and it's a rather sort of bureaucratic way, but I mean, I think it, it means that you are then um, part of our network. It's an inclusive network. We want to involve as many people as possible across the member states, and it sets out very clearly um, on our website what kind of things um, we're doing. We would love to um, hear um, ideas. Uh, you've already um, become part of our network because you're attending this event today. We're a bit like a sort of secret sect in a way. Once you get touched by us, we won't let you go. Uh, wherever you go, we'll, we'll try and sort of make sure that you're um, included. Um, today's sort of objective really, first of all, it's, it's great to, to be able to continue this relationship with the uh, IIEA in, in Dublin. It's fantastic that your support has, has really been appreciated. And the second thing really is to sort of give a taste of the sort of research that we've been commissioning um, and that Jeremy and Henrik will, uh, Henrik will do, to sort of really show you the kind of things we're looking at, the fresh research we're doing. And the sort of third thing is really to you know, create a dialogue, to, to see what uh, one of the key member states in the European Union, the, the kind of expertise here, the interest in China here would be. And just finally, finally before we kick off, I think there's one um, statistic that I think always kind of stays with me. Um, my former boss in Beijing, the um, British ambassador there in, I think, 19, uh, sorry, 2002, I remember when he arrived at the embassy, he sort of made this talk where he said the first time he'd come to China was in, um, I think, 1971. And he said, on that day, uh, the only way that you could enter China um, as a European was through Hong Kong um, into what became Shenzhen, but was at that time a small fishing village. Now it's a um, city of 10 million people. 
And um, that day, the only people that entered China, all of China from Europe, was three people. Um, between 1949 and 1978, according to the National Bureau of Statistics, there were something like 750,000 people movements between China and the outside world, people leaving and coming back, people visiting and departing. From the whole of that time, nearly three decades, only 750,000. Um, the last year that I have statistics for in 2006, um, 46 million in one year. So you can see there you know, the kind of incredible increase, the fact that we do have to have you know, our kind of um, knowledge used. We do have to uh, be um, aware of this sort of enormous transformation that is happening uh, with China becoming more and more prominent. We need to you know, embrace that and to be able to have a strategy, as I think we were talking about earlier, a strategy to deal with it, to um, work together, to find areas of common interest. There'll be areas where, obviously, we disagree, but these are natural things in any dialogue. But we really want to make sure that our policy makers, um, who, after all, have really opened their doors to this decision, this um, project, are given the best possible advice and the best possible analysis so that they can then uh, do something with it.